Okay, let's begin. Um, firstly, uh, thank you everyone for supporting today's event. This is our first with a UK morning and Australian evening time slot. We're delighted to welcome. Good evening. Good evening. We're delighted to welcome over a hundred attendees today from Germany, Ireland, New Zealand, the United States, well, I... as well as Australia and the UK. At any time during the event, should you wish to submit one or more questions, you can do so by selecting the chat button on Zoom and a text box will appear. The questions you sent via this box will be forwarded on. Today, we're also doing something else a little differently. At the end of the one hour discussion, we will be opening up breakout or chat rooms for those who wish to stay on to meet other participants and discuss the points raised during the webinar. Zoom will randomly pick who we'll goes into each room and the rooms will stay open for one hour. The topic of today's event is the future of the church in Australia, and we are delighted to welcome Archbishop Jim Costello and Mark Coleridge. Chairing today will be the Vatican correspondent for the tablet, Christopher Lamb, who is also author of The Outsider, Pope Francis and his battle to reform the church. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome everyone. I'm delighted uh, to see so many of you here to register uh, and be part of this event. Thank you, Archbishop Mark and Archbishop Tim for joining us. Um, it's great to have you here for this very important discussion. Um, the first part of the evening will be, or morning will be an interview, and then we'll go into questions. If I can ask everyone uh, who's not on speaking on the call to mute, that would be great so we don't have interruptions. Um, we will, of course, come to questions and we encourage you to, to submit those. The aim of the event is really to learn more about the Plenary Council uh, process in Australia. Um, hello, hello, hello. An example of the synodal reform that Pope Francis has called for in the hello, church. Hello, hello, hello. So Australia is in many respects leading the way and has been uh, undergoing a process uh, uh, of, of synodality for some time. Archbishop Tim is president of the Plenary Council, and Archbishop Mark, of course, is president of the Australian Bishop. Good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm also um, delighted to have joining us this evening, Carol Teodori, who is a lay delegate at the Plenary Council. So- um, Good evening, good evening, good evening. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. If we could encourage people to mute, that would be great. Okay. Um, so the- Plenary Council recently released its working document um, and it stated that the church communities, ministries and operations Good evening, good evening, good evening with a business as usual attitude Five past eight um, I'd like to start the, the Nothing's first happening oh. Ian, is it possible to mute um... Michael Kelly, Rose Dunn. Okay um, So the first question to Archbishop Tim how can the Plenary Council um, be a vehicle for reform and renewal in the church, given there has been, of course, so much hurt and scandal in terms of the abuse crisis in the past? How can this synodal process help renew the church in Australia? Thank you, Chris, and, and good evening or good morning to everybody. Um, it's a big sort of opening question, a big question to try and respond to uh, in, in a simple way. I think that just the process that we're going through, which, as you've said, Chris, is a synodal process, um, is already the beginnings of a renewal for the church in Australia. Uh, perhaps, perhaps during the course of the of the webinar, we'll have a chance to explain a little more how we've been operating. But I, I've been surprised by the number of people right around the country who say things like, even if nothing else happens, and I hope that's not the case, I hope lots of other things happen, but even if nothing else happens, the fact that everyone in the church has been invited to share what's on their heart uh, and to speak what's in their heart uh, and hopefully also to listen to what's on the heart of other people. Uh, many people have said, this is the first time I've had, first chance I've had as a Catholic to actually do this. And it's been in a local parish group or a, another kind of church community group. Um, so I think the very opportunity that uh, right across the church in Australia we've given people or invited people just to speak from the depths of their own experience in a prayerful and discerning way is the beginnings of a renewal in, in the church in Australia there's a long way to go but I think it's a good start yeah, of course, the synodal process is designed to echo 
the road to Emmaus, the, 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 has, it has biblical roots and it's on the journey that the disciples encounter Jesus. So it is the journeying that is so important and the process. Is, is that well, what you're saying? It's actually through that, through that journeying, then you come to the, the, the next steps for the mission of, of the church. I think so, and, and uh, it's a good point to make that it uh, it mirrors the experience of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's been a long journey and will continue to be a long journey. And although in some ways that seems to have, in a sense, dragged things out, in another sense, it actually gives us time. And I, I was commenting about this to someone earlier that the, one of the great strengths of our process is that it's not a rushed process. It's been going on for a number of years. We're heading up now to the first assembly in October. The plenary council then continues for the next eight months until the second assembly in July of next year. And then of course, it continues as we implement it. So it's a long and deliberate journey. And the strength of that is uh, that it enables us to really, I would say as a church, community here in Australia to learn through practice what it means to be a discerning church. So that certainly the journey uh, is in, in, in a sense, one of the greatest elements of the whole process for us. If I could just chip in at this point, Chris, the journey in fact didn't begin just in 2016 when the bishops eventually decided to, to make a decision to move towards a plenary council. The roots of it go back into the early 2000s. And it was, in fact, the, the recently deceased Archbishop Emeritus of Adelaide, Philip Wilson, who in about 2002 said to the bishops that we need some kind of national ecclesial event because there was a sense at, at that time of trouble brewing because the, uh, the sexual abuse crisis was attaining a new kind of intensity. But also Pope John Paul II had published at the end of the Jubilee year of 2000, Novo Millennio in Eunte, and that was a seminal text in this journey of the plenary council. But there was no agreement initially among the bishops. So a whole process of debate and discernment went on from about 2002 until 2012, when we had the year of grace, which was a summons as it were to the whole church in Australia to enter into a time of retreat thinking that, that that moment of contemplating the face of Christ, again, the language of Novo Millennio and Eunte, would equip us better for a decision at the end of that, uh, that year of grace. And that was an extraordinary experience. It was a moment of grace. But then in 2013, two things converged strangely to, to give this whole process great momentum. One was the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Sexual Abuse of Children. Uh, we didn't really see that coming. We wasn't sure where it would take us, but it was uh, a moment that, that, that focused the sense of crisis. The second thing that happened in 2013 was the election of Pope Francis, which again, to me and to many was unforeseen or unforeseeable. Now, both Pope Francis, with all the freshness that he's brought to the church and the Royal Commission, with the, 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 the agony that that was, we're calling the church to become what the church is supposed to be beyond all the betrayals. Then in 2015, there was the Synod on Marriage and the Family. And you'll remember, I'm sure Chris and many will, the extraordinary talk that Pope Francis gave on October the 17th in that Synod. And that was a moment when for me personally, there was something like a flash of inspiration when I thought that after all the years of uncertainty, uh, and hesitation, the discussion, the discernment, this was the time. Uh, it, it was that talk that certainly focused me. And eventually I think that led to the decision in 2016 by the Bishops' Conference to move towards a plenary council. So this journey has a very long prehistory yep. and it will have an equally long post-history. But it is important to, to, to see it at the plenary council not so much as an event, as a, as a process, a journey in biblical terms, and to see that it was born from the perception of crisis. And that's the first stage to any renewal. On, that, um, that is it, a sense of crisis, not just a cosy, comfortable, uh, gradual renewal, but something more disruptive, which seems to me the, the, the way the Holy Spirit is working at this time. 
It was a moment and is a moment where we didn't know, we don't know where we're going. I read a book recently, a good title, title better than the book, in fact. The title, How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going. And that's where we are. And it's out of that sense, it's an Abrahamic sense, in fact, that the uh, intuition of the Plenary Council was born and now bears fruit, as it will in the future. Well, thank you for that uh, very important um, context to what's been happening in, in Australia. And, and of course, I do remember that speech the Pope gave very well, where he said, uh, in, this is October 2015, where he said that, that synodality is what the Lord expects of the church in the third millennium. And of course, we are seeing um, a kind of eruption of synodality in parts of the world. We're seeing a obviously a synod process in Germany. We're seeing initiatives in Italy, Ireland, the Amazon, Latin America. Well, what, what are you learning about this synodal process from what you've done so far? What, are, what have your kind of main takeaways been from it? And that could be Archbishop Mark or Archbishop Tim. Well, if I, I start, because I'm on a bit of a roll, Tim, then I'll pass to you. Um, <laughs> um, look, I think we're learning that the whole process is very slow and very messy. Autocracy was always quicker and cleaner. But if you are serious, and we are, about listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, who is the only one who does know where we're going, like Abraham, uh, then it's, it is slow, it's messy, trying to hear the voice of the Spirit in the vast cacophony or polyphony of the church is a great challenge. And I think that's one of the things that we've learned. But I remember too, that synod in 2015, Chris, about halfway through, I thought this is going nowhere. It was all over the place. And I couldn't see how in 10 days' time we would produce anything worth producing. And in fact, at the end of that 10 days, we did produce something that wasn't the final word, but it was worth producing, that final statement that led to Amoris Letizia. So that experience of discernment was the most powerful experience of discernment I'd ever had. And for me, it was a kind of awakening. And I sought to share that with the other bishops and many others beyond. So, so I think one of the things that I and we have learned or are learning because it goes on and on, is that this is slow, messy, but it's the only way into a future that is worth having or a future that God might have in mind for us. Because if, if you take the Holy Spirit out of this whole process, all you're left with is politics. And if all you're left with is politics, who cares? I don't, and I'm not sure any of us should. But there is something greater than Solomon here. And I, that was the sense I had of that Synod in 2015, there was something greater than Solomon there. Solomon's around big time, but there is something greater, Margis. Uh, Archbishop Tim. Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I'd certainly agree with Mark, Archbishop Mark, that um, we're learning that uh, trying to be a synodal church uh, is a bit messy, as, as Mark says, and I think Pope Francis has often uh, spoken about this kind of thing. I remember at one of the World Youth Days, he was uh, telling the young people to go out and make a mess, make some noise and make a mess. Um, it is messy, uh, but I think, as Pope Francis is making very clear, it is the way of the church now and into the future. Um, I'm sure many of the people taking part in the webinar have uh, seen and possibly read right through uh, Pope Francis's latest little book, uh, Let Us Dream. Uh, and there, as in so many other places, he talks about uh, synodality and says the practice of synodality has to begin at the grassroots, so to speak. Um, and that's what we did here uh, with our plenary council. Uh, apart from the structures that we established with a facilitation team and an executive committee and a bishop's commission and all of those things, uh, we focused on engaging everybody in the church as widely as we possibly could um, so that we were genuinely all listening to each other's voices. And I think that's the key to this. Um, one of the phrases that we've often used is uh, the plenary council is about listening to God by listening to each other. And so we tried to do that and we had a very extensive um, 
consultation, I guess, is the most accessible way of describing it, a very extensive consultation, over 220,000 uh, responses. Um, uh, and then we, we started from there and we've been working through ever since. But one of the things that emerged for me in that whole process, because we had this, we called it a listening and dialogue process. And that then led to a next stage, which was a listening and discernment process. But the listening and dialogue process was an invitation to people right across the country to gather in small groups around the dinner table if a family's doing it or in a school staff or a parish community or whatever it might be, gather in small groups and reflect on a really important question. And um, I don't want to go on and on, but I often reflect on the way the question was formulated because we had this group, this facilitation team and an executive mm -hmm. committee, which is largely made up of lay people, a couple of bishops and uh, other clergy thrown in. Um, but we had three days in, in Archbishop Mark's diocese, uh, sort of a mini retreat experience for us where we tried to determine the question. And at the start of the three days, the question was very much about what would you like to see for the church in the future? What does the church need in Australia in the future? How should we go forward? And they're all really good questions. But over the course of the three days, and again, it was a little bit like a, a light bulb moment, I think the group together discerned that there was something missing from that question. And the thing that was missing was God. Pretty important in a, a church-focused uh, endeavour. And so the question changed and the question became, what do you think? And the you could be an individual, it could be a parish group, it could be any group of people in the church. What do you think God is asking of us in Australia at this time? And that changed the whole thing. So we wanted to listen and we did try and are trying to listen to everybody's voices. But what we're hoping is that the voices express what people have discerned is what God is dreaming for the church in Australia, which may or may not be the same as what any one of us might be dreaming for the church in Australia. And that's the big challenge, I think, in this whole synodal process that we're facing here. Uh, I've often said, and I, I, I'm not ashamed to say it, although in a sense you could be embarrassed about saying it, church in Australia has been very successful in lots of things, but I don't think we're very successful, at least not very well versed in the art of discernment. We're doers, but I'm not sure that we've been very good at discerning. And um, discerning, as I mentioned before, I think it takes time, and it hello. takes it takes time. Hello. And it ta um, hello, whoever it is. It <laughs> takes time. It takes careful listening. It takes a lot of humility and a readiness to let go of my cherished ideas, perhaps because uh, I might be learning something from listening to someone else. I'll just finish because I'm sure there's lots of other things to discuss, but if you look at, and you can get it on the website of the Plenary Council for anyone who's interesting, but if you look at the responses that came in from that initial um, consultation. Hello! There's, oh, there's an extraordinary range of, of uh, responses uh, which express the heartfelt feelings of, of people but often they're very different and sometimes even contradictory. And I think that's the challenge when we talk about listening. How do we listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit coming through this multiplicity of voices, uh, which can't all in a sense be the voice, of, well, they can all be the voice of the Holy Spirit in one sense, but particularly when they're quite starkly contradictory and, and difficult to reconcile. So how do we hear the voice of the Spirit speaking through the voices of the people of God here in the church in Australia? That's the big challenge. And uh, so that's where we went from the listening and uh, dialogue to a deeper listening and discernment, then to a, an ongoing process, which eventually led to the working document, which will eventually then lead to an agenda and then to the First Assembly. So uh, so, the and each of, each, of those, is the key. Uh, each of those documents to which Tim refers are simply a report from down under, as it were, in the process of discernment. The latest uh, report is the working document. But keep in mind that though it's called an instrumentum laboris, as uh, we have with Roman synods of bishops, 
It's a very different kind of document. It doesn't um, frame the agenda in quite the same way. What it sought to do was to uh, draw upon the six thematic papers that were prepared. Again, as another kind of report on the, the, the process of discernment. So that you can't claim too much for the, the in instrumentum laboris, but nor can you uh, dismiss it. But the next step in this process will be, as Tim has said, to, to produce an agenda for the two assemblies and that crucial period of fermentation between the two assemblies. Uh, because like the Second Vatican Council, a lot of the real action will go on between the assemblies, not at the assemblies. So we need an agenda that is faithful to the process of discernment and consultation that accompanied it, and then is focused and manageable and geared to action because eventually discernment, however slow it is, has to um, yield some kind of decision with a view to action. Yes, and uh, you can't go on discerning forever and ever, amen, and not sure. come to decision and action. Sure, I'd, I'd like to just pick up what you said about uh, earlier. You said that it auto, it autocracy was easy. Um, one of the things that this council, plenary council process has, has uh, provoked is a big question around church <laughs> governance, how to include lay people and women into leadership roles. Can you tell us what you would like to see in that area? What, 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 what's on the agenda there in terms of a new type of governance of the church? And I'm thinking particularly of the, the light of the Southern Cross report that you that, that was commissioned. Um, yeah, well, which... certainly that report feeds into the Plenary Council. We said it from way, way back that the, the, the journey of the Plenary Council replaces nothing. It simply gathers to itself gracefully everything and including an important document like the uh, light from the Southern Cross. Mind you, bishops don't have to wait until the assemblies and, and decisions of the plenary council. Many bishops, including myself, are already looking at uh, what implications for the diocese that report may have. But look, I think we do need a, a less hierarchical, dare I say, a less monarchical kind of governance, the kind of thing that Pope Francis is seeking to do, even with the papacy. I mean, again, if I go back to that synod in 2015, it was an astonishing experience of the papacy done differently, not, not monarchically or hierarchically, but in, in so many ways in what he said and what he did, Pope Francis made it clear that he was a bishop among bishops. And, and when you were used to the other thing, uh, it, it was almost a shock, um, but it didn't diminish the Petrine office. In, if anything, it showed more clearly what the papacy is supposed to be at this time. So I think we do need, and again, I, I some fear the, that the Episcopal ministry or office is being undermined. I don't fear that at all. I think it's being resituated, but again, in a way that might show it forth more clearly than does uh, uh, the hierarchical or monarchical mode, which is not what we, we need at this time. And I don't think it's what the spirit is saying. Now, with regard to women, Absolutely. The, certainly in a church that says we cannot ordain women to the priesthood, or perhaps even to the diaconate, that church is equally obliged, in my view and in the view of many, to keep asking the question, how else might we include in imaginative and new ways women, not just at the point of management, but even at governance, uh, fully aware of the constraints of, of canon law at this time? But... Uh, but there are all kinds of um, lateral thinking that can be done at this point. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of exercising a kind of evangelical imagination to ask how women can lead and, okay. and, and not just repeating forms of the past, but creating new forms. And this is, I look to the Holy Spirit to do this because left to our own devices, we'll just come up with the same tired old recipes. We need something fresh and something as lateral as only the Holy Spirit can do, I think. And so we could see women running dioceses in, in, in some respects, alongside, obviously, the, the bishop. Yeah, I mean, running is, is inverted commas, I guess. It, it depends what you mean by it. But, I mean, look, for instance, in my own diocese, I have two women who sit with the Episcopal Council and the College of Consultors and the Council of Priests. 
Now, they can't be members, but there's nothing in church law that says they can't attend the meetings and take part in the discussion. They do, and they make a precious and unique contribution. So that's a, that's a very simple and modest uh, instance of what I'm talking about. So surrounding the bishop, as it were, again, in the journeying together, listening to each other, so that the bishop isn't in... Um, splendid isolation says he's sitting in his big house here but uh but is is on the road with others and a lot of them probably half of them at least are women and there are a lot of wise women around well um i, th I think it is that's obviously the the issue of of one of the big issues of the day for the for the church how does how does this inclusion of women take place I, i'd like to ask archbishop tim though mm. some people in the church are nervous about synodality and the synodal process because it unleashes divisions it exposes disagreement uh, and it also leads to say one small group here demanding this change another small group here saying no we can't have any change how are you managing disagreements and how are you making sure this is not just about certain groups in the church having just a bigger voice than they might already have mm. Uh, well, I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. And the first thing that comes to my mind is that we have a whole team of people, not just me or, or Archbishop Mark, um, working on the Plenary Council. And certainly um, the young woman who is the, the leader of the facilitation team, Lana Turvey Collins, is doing a wonderful job, I think, of, of engaging with people from right across the spectrum. Because the church in Australia, like anywhere else, uh, has all sorts of groups with all sorts of different perspectives on all sorts of different issues. I think the first thing is, is to listen. I think we've got to keep going back to this. We have to listen and we shouldn't be uh, telling people they're not allowed to say this or that's, that can't even be raised or anything like that. We have to be prepared to listen. But I think along with the readiness to listen is the readiness to, or the, the preparedness to let go, if I have to, of something that might be precious to me, as I also listen to other people and begin to see something new. Pope Francis, again, in, in Let Us Dream, but in lots of other places too, talks about this whole problem of, or problem, reality of, of disagreements. And he doesn't see that as necessarily uh, a major problem. He sees it as an opportunity, as long as it's situated within a, within a context of genuine listening to each other. And in that, trying to listen for, the, for the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's not easy. And I think what I would say one of the, the, I don't want to say frustrating things. It's not frustrating so much. But one of the things that I, I'm struggling with a little bit is that there are, <clears throat> pardon me, there are some uh, people, uh, some groups who already seem to know what the outcome of the council must be. Um, and even in the question you asked earlier, Chris, about what, Archbishop Mark or I might want to see in terms of governance. I'm very wary, I mean, I'm happy to share my thoughts, but I, I'm very wary of, of speaking too specifically about any of these things because the whole point of this process of discernment is that we don't preempt it. We don't know what the Holy Spirit's going to do with us when we come together in October or what the Holy Spirit will lead us into between October and July next year or what will come out of July next year to preempt things and say, well, whatever else happens, this has to happen. Um, I just get a little nervous about that. I'm trying myself to remain as, as open as I can to every possibility. Um, yeah, so... Uh, and I think part of the anxiety that people experience can be a loss of control. And this can be true particularly of people like bishops who are used to being in charge. But I, I think the point that Tim makes is crucial. There has to be a, prepare, a certain humility and an openness to the unexpected that makes a certain loss of control uh, possible and creative. Um, I, I too share Tim's um, apprehension when I hear voices that are too confident that they know the way into the future. And it's as if we don't have to listen to the Holy Spirit, we just listen to them and, and, and do what they say and all will be well. I'm not sure it's like that. 
Uh, everyone has, has a part to play or a word to speak, but, but no one has the word to speak. So I, I think it does take a, um, a self-awareness, a humility, um, and, and a, a new sense of the church. And I say this particularly perhaps of the bishops, but for all of us, that um, each of us will have our word, but the word will only be found when there is a polyphony of those words and not a cacophony where I'm trying to beat you over the head because I have the truth. That cannot be the way of the church. It might be the way of the parliament. But as Pope Francis has said, and, and the point's an obvious one, a, a plenary council is not a parliament. It may have aspects, of course, of a parliamentary operation, but it, it's something much uh, more mysterious than any, any parliament that I know. Okay, well, the questions are coming in thick and fast. Sorry, Archbishop Tim, did you want to... To, to yeah, back. Chris, look, just in relationship to all of this, because it's, it's a point that I think is worth making, particularly for other parts of the, the ch church around the world that might be either engaged in or thinking of engaging this, in this kind of process. Um, trying to listen to all the voices and genuinely inviting everyone to, to, to speak is, is vital, but it's not easy to get everyone to speak, if I can put it that way. Um, most people... Uh, on the webinar now uh, from Australia, I know, and most people who aren't would also be aware that Australia is one of the most multicultural societies uh, in the world, and therefore one of, we have one of the most multicultural churches in the world. We've been very successful, I think, in engaging uh, a big cohort of the church, but, and I was just talking to Lana, the leader of the facilitation team about this yesterday, I don't believe we've still been successful in really engaging, for example, with all of those people, and it's an awfully big number of them in Australia, for whom English is a second language, but for whom the church is a really important part of their lives. So the challenge of listening to all the voices is a really important one. I can remember, and I'll just finish with this, but I think it might sound a bit blunt, but I think it's helpful to make the point. Right at the start of this, someone we invited someone to come and speak to us about the whole process. And we were talking about the consultation process and how we were trying to engage everyone. And he said, good, and that's really important and you must do that. He said, just be careful that you don't end up listening only to the white, educated, affluent voice of the church because the church is bigger than that. And I'm not sure that we've quite succeeded uh, in, in responding to that challenge that he presented us with. I think that's a really important thing. And particularly at a time when not only in Australia, but around the world, the center of gravity is moving within the church. Uh, the face of the bride of Christ darkens by the day, with the center of gravity moving to Africa, Asia and Latin America. And that's, that's evident here. The other group that we, we haven't succeeded in listening to as we had hoped is the, the, the very large group of people who have either never really been baptized, but they've never really been part of the church's journey, or those who have walked away, and there are many of those. Uh, many of them angry, some of them, dis many of them disillusioned and so on. I think we would say that we would love to have heard more from that group. And I noticed that the Irish bishops, in, in saying that they are going to move towards some kind of synodal process, uh, the, the first thing they said was to listen to the voice of the many who have walked away in Ireland. So, um, so that remains a, a big challenge and will have to be somewhere, I think, on the agenda of the, of the Plenary Council. Sure. And talking of the question of, of inclusion and not exclusion, I was wondering if uh, Archbishop Mark, I know you sent a tweet out about this, about the, the ruling from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith about uh, blessings of same-sex couples that the church is not able to do that. Um, what is your... Uh, take on that? Well, uh, it was absolutely no surprise, nor was the reaction to it by and large. All I sought to say in the tweet, I, I thought it was, it was more or less stating the obvious, but if a church says, and it relates to what I said before about ordaining women, if the church says, unsurprisingly, that we are unable to bless same-sex unions, then that church is equally obliged to, to really grapple with the question, 
But how else might we, in new and creative ways, include same-sex couples who are bringing their children to, for baptism, who are bringing their children to our schools and so on? And, and this may well... I'm not saying that it will involve a radical overturning of the church's vision of the human being and the teaching on sexuality that flows from it, but, but we, we have to come to grips with a lot of the, uh, the newer insights into human sexuality, and, and that may be part of this grappling. So it's one thing to say we can't ordain women. We've got to then ask how else might we include women. It's one thing to say we can't bless same-sex unions, well, let's then commit ourselves to grappling with the question, how else might we include same-sex uh, couples? So uh, this sort of question of, of, of being an inclusive church has figured very strongly in the consultation process. It's hard to believe that it won't figure somewhere in the, in the uh, agenda of the Plenary Council, because it's just not enough to say we can't, we can't. That may be important, but it's only one word in a much, much longer and more complex conversation. And, and so in, in that sense, what the CDF has said in that statement uh, isn't by any means uh, causa finita est, the end of the conversation. Uh, it simply, it, I think it should, it should give greater uh, impetus to another kind of conversation about inclusion. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in and before I start taking all of them individually, um, we might have to uh, uh, group some together. But I'd like to go to Carol Teodori, who is a lay delegate at the Plenary Council. Um, I don't know if Carol can hear me and if she's there. Here. Here yes. I am. Hi, hi, Carol. So I was wondering if, you, if I could just ask you, um, what, are, what are your hopes for the, for the Plenary Council process? Well, I guess one of my most basic hopes is that whenever and wherever we gather, which has been hard in the last year, whenever and wherever we gather, we are recognizing each other as brothers and sisters on a pilgrimage and that none of us know where we're going or what the consequences in our lives will be at the end of the road. What's been wonderful in my life experience as a as in the ministry of the church since I was very, very young, um, is that I'm, I'm recognizing the bigger church. I've always been per in the parishes. The people of God have been my people. And even I've made the question be a, par a parishional, a parishes, parishes question. What is God asking of the people of God in the present time? What is God asking of the people of God? That's the way I would approach it in my parish because how do we go? What do we do? What has been really good from, for parish life has been that we have been, the leaders of parishes have been invited to form de deanery councils, which have been a tremendous success in the Blue Mountains where I live. Um, and also a diocesan pastoral council. It's giving voice to women and men, lay women and men, who have been in love with their work in the church. It's been my way, it's, the church has, has been leading me since I was young by the heartstrings. Every time an invitation would come, I would say, oh, they think I can do that. Yes, I will do it all of my life that's happening and it's leading me into bigger and bigger spaces. How did I get here? <laughs> and what the, what the plenary council has done for my, me and my people is teach us how to discern on every level of the parish life or di diocesan life, we've been learning to discern. It's, it's led me into a different way of being present in my life, really. Well, thank you. And um, it would be great to continue to hear all, all the different experiences. But I, I'm also going to now uh, go to some questions. We've had questions that are in the chat box. We've had questions that have been sent through earlier. And I'm going to try and pick out 
as many as I, I can, um, which we haven't. Some of the issues that are raised in the questions have already been covered. But so um, one of the questions that came in, an inquirer from New South Wales has said, um, given that the Pope has, Pope Francis has called for um, a synodal church and has called for, uh, or is saying that all the answers can't necessarily come from Rome, um, why are we not being more adventurous? So could you be bolder, do you think, in the in the plenary council, Archbishop Mark? Or... Well, uh, I think, in fact, we have been fairly bold. But again, I, that might be from the timidity of the episcopate. Uh, what, what I consider boldness, others may not judge to be so. Look, certainly in my time, I, I'm, what am I, 19 years a bishop. And the decision to move to the plenary council was certainly the, the boldest decision taken by the bishops in that time. Um, and I hope that there will be some bold decisions under the influence of the Holy Spirit, again, like the bishop's decision, uh, taken at the, um, at the plenary council itself. I, some, the, the, I sometimes think of the extraordinary decision taken by the, the bishops back in the 1870s to set up their own Catholic schools in Australia. It looked madness at the time, and it was incredibly bold, but, uh, uh, and the risks were enormous, but it turned out to be a triumph. And I asked myself, well, what is the kind of decision that we might take now, all these years later, as bishops and as the church in Australia, um, that is equally bold and, and perhaps looks a bit mad? I don't know, but I do know it's that kind of decision that a... Uh, a plenary council looks to. So um, have we been too timid? I don't know. Tim himself may have uh, thoughts on that. I don't think so, but we haven't, uh, we haven't been sort of brave, bold bishops to delivering, you know, audacity from on high. That's not the process to which we're committed. Um, so it's just, I, I would struggle at this stage to know exactly what greater boldness would look like. But as I say, Tim might have other thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that it's, when say, why haven't we, I'm wondering who the we is. If it means the bishops, um, I, I would be uncomfortable with that because this is a, a council of the whole church and it's the whole church community together who's either going to be timid or bold or brave or cowardly or whatever. Um, it's, I, I know the danger in saying this is that it sounds like I'm just putting things off, but I, I genuinely do believe that we, we shouldn't be preempting anything. We don't know what the outcome of the plenary council will be or what, what proposals or decisions or new directions we might strike out in. We just don't know. Uh, People might, um, at the end of it, all say, why were you so bold? Why weren't you a little bit more careful? Yes. We have to wait and see. Okay. Honestly, I think that's the thing. Um, um, there's a question here from um, Peter Manning, who says that one of the problems or is at the grassroots of, of Catholic life in Australia is that many parish priests are caught up in the hierarchical clerical nature of their identity and are blind to the charismatic gifts of many of their parishioners. Lay people and their gifts are withering on the vine. Will this issue be on the agenda? Well, I think it certainly is on the agenda and has been, I think, for some years. It doesn't, we don't, again, don't have to wait for the plenary council. I mean, I am personally convinced we are at a charismatic moment in the life of the church. That's part of what I mean when I say this is a moment of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, acting and, and erupting almost in, in ways that are, are new and perhaps unforeseen. Um, so so the, the, the question now is to identify the gifts of the spirit and to do whatever is necessary to ensure that those gifts flourish for the sake, not just of the church, but for the sake of the church's mission, which is different. Again, uh, so, so look, that, that, that there are some of the ordained who, who fit the profile of clericalism that Pope Francis, I think, has described more vividly than anyone, uh, is certain. Um, that there are many others who don't conform to that profile is equally certain in my view. And perhaps it's not a question of black and white. We're all 
all of the ordained, you know, have a tinge of the dark and a uh, tinge of the light as well. So uh, I, certainly the, the need to set aside anything that resembles clericalism as it's been described was made clear by the Royal Commission. It doesn't take a plenary council to, to say that in the same way. The question is now building upon that agonising experience of the Royal Commission, what does it mean in terms of the way we, 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 we choose leaders, we form leaders, and, and we, we are through their life, uh, and exercise leadership once ordination has happened? These sorts of questions, the, certainly the question of leadership, will, will be, I think, uh, a, a, a big item on the agenda of the Plenary Council because the current mode of leadership in the church is simply unsustainable for some reasons that are very obvious, are less so. So, um, so yes, leadership is at the, the heart of uh, the question that we're facing. We, we've now we've got a couple of technical questions, um, which probably can be answered quite quickly. Um, but one of them is from uh, Brian Gleeson, another from Phil McCarthy from Caritas. The first is, are the rules of participation at the actual sessions, with the bishops being the, own, the, the, the ones voting or others not, or hardly at all? So is that, is that the case? Um, and then the other thing is, could something be said about the difference between a synod and a plenary council and why the Australian bishops chose the latter? Well, Tim, why don't you take the first and I'll take the second? All right, yes, well, um, every delegate, uh, formal delegate to the uh, Plenary Council has a vote. Now, only the bishops have a, um, Mark, help me, what's the uh, deliberative Delib vote? Uh, but everyone has a consultative vote. Um, and that's because of the particular nature of the understanding of the role of the bishop in the church, uh, as it's expressed in canon law and the Plenary Council. Um, but people make a distinction between the, um, the making of a decision and the taking of a decision. And the decisions will be made and proposed by everybody. And then for canonical reasons, uh, the final um, delivery vote will be taken by the bishop. So it's not a question of some having a vote and some not. Everybody shares in the movement towards consensus, which is, I really think, part of what Pope Francis is on about when he talks about um, synodality. Uh, so everyone's involved in that process. And if there is a need for a deliberative vote about some particular issue, then then that's uh, the um, the role of the bishops. So is sure. that, I don't know if that explains it, but that's basically it, I think. Keeping in mind that at a synod of bishops in Rome, the only bishop in, in the aula who has a deliberative vote is the Pope. Every other bishop has a consultative vote. Now that doesn't answer the question, but it's just worth keeping in mind. And I wouldn't overdraw the distinction either between uh, consultative and deliberative. And I think the word consensus that Tim has thrown into the mix is a very important word. To the other question about synod and council, this is something that has exercised the bishops over these um, years of the journey. Uh, initially, the question was what kind of ecclesial assembly and obviously a synod was considered, but uh, a number of bishops and certainly Archbishop Wilson, whom I mentioned earlier, were, were strongly in favor of a plenary council. And this is because it's canonically a more solemn gathering and has a more uh, um, evident decision-making power. Uh, synods are, are not as solemn canonically, if I could put it in those terms. And, and it, it, synods don't have the same deliberative power as, as a plenary council. And, and therefore run the risk of becoming just a talk thing. Doesn't mean to say they're valueless because the process can be the product and often is, but a plenary council is anything but a talk fest, however long the preparation takes. It is a moment of, of decision-making, uh, legislation, again, if you want to talk the language of law uh, and, and decrees. Now, and, and these would be geared to, to to charting a very particular path into the future for the church in this country. Keeping in mind too, that once the decisions are made and, and the decrees are formulated, um, that they are sent to the Bishop of Rome for a final act of discernment that what has been decided is in harmony with the doctrine and discipline of the universal church. So, so um, 
So therefore, we, we, we decided for a plenary council. I've had moments of wondering whether a synod might have been perhaps a safer or, or um, easier choice. Uh, other bishops have raised the same question. But for us, it is a plenary council. I'm interested to see that other countries like Ireland and Germany and Italy seem not to be going down that path. And I was very struck when, when we decided for the plenary council to learn how few plenary councils there had been since the Second Vatican Council. So, um, so for us, it is a plenary council, which is the most solemn act in, in church law because it is um, very much geared to decision and action beyond the talk. Okay, thank you. Um, Wendy Baker asks, how will the journey of the Australian church be inclusive of and traveling beside the first peoples of our land? That is a huge question. And yeah. I, if I could respond uh, again, uh, Tim would have his own thoughts in the West, but um, I think that is the running sore at the heart of this nation. I think the church needs to, uh, having lost so much credibility across the board and trust with it, we need to identify certain areas where we might build a new kind of trust and credibility. And I think a new kind of engagement with the First Nations peoples is one of those areas. I think we need a whole new imagining of our engagement beyond the evident failures of the past. And um, uh, what that might look like, I do not know, but I am convinced that that is one of the things the Spirit is saying to the church in this country, that, that we need to imagine and then boldly enact a whole new engagement of the of the gospel with the first nations people and in that process they will have to be the protagonists now what does that mean in concrete practical terms i think is a crucial question for the plenary council and beyond may i say that i think we should be asking questions of the aboriginal people themselves we ought to be initiating the action we ought to be there first and ask them to come to, and, and there are many uh, different dioceses that do have uh, a facility to talk to them. We should be bringing them together with us. We've tried to do that, haven't we, Tim? We have, yes. Uh, in the part of Australia where I live, uh, there's a, a bigger percentage of uh, native peoples, original inhabitants, uh, than in some other parts of the country. So it's a very big issue over here in the West. Um, if you look at the Instrumentum Laboris, you'll find that there is, is a significant section there which raises some of these issues. Uh, I agree with Mark completely. It's a, the whole desperate situation of the Aboriginal people of Australia is a running sore for us. I, I've said a lot tonight about not preempting anything, but one of the one of the things that emerges very strongly when you step back and have a look at everything that has been part of the process so far, is that there has to be a turn for the church from an inward looking church to an outward looking church. And uh, a big part of that uh, is our attention to this issue of, of this group of people who are the most disadvantaged people in the country. So there's no doubt in my mind it will be a major issue uh, during the plenary council. There are a significant number of delegates from the uh, Aboriginal community who will be part of the Plenary Council. Uh, so it's more than tokenism, I, that's what I wanted to, to stress. But um, look, it, for the last, whatever it is, nearly 300 years of European settlement in Australia, we've made a mess of this and we're still struggling to get it right. And it's up to the church to continue to grapple with this issue. Sure. What we've so, never done yeah. is really <laughs> the Indigenous communities. And that's where it's got to start. We really do have to listen to them in a way that, that shows we believe we can actually learn from them. I don't think we've ever believed that. And therefore we've never really listened to them. You know, we've told them and done a lot of other stuff that's only made things work. Anyway, this is getting too far into the theme perhaps, but listening to them and learning from them is at the heart of the process. Okay, no, I'm, I'm darting around a bit with the questions, but I'm going to go to one from um, Germany, from Theresa Homan, who says to Archbishop Coleridge, you said twice that the church says, in inverted commas, 
that women cannot be ordained and gay people cannot be allowed, gay couples cannot be blessed. But you've also said that we've got to look at new ways of involving women in leading positions. Here in Germany, we started at an earlier point. More and more people, bishops and, and laymen, don't see it as a given anymore that women can't be ordained. They question if what the church is saying is really showing, still showing the will of God. So will you discuss the question of ordination during the plenary council or do you see it as a given? Well, I, 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 I don't think it will be discussed, frankly, because I, I don't think the plenary council has the liberty to simply disregard the papal magisterium. And that's, again, a plenary council very consciously takes its place within the universal church. It's why the, 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 the Bishop of Rome had to approve the plenary council. He had to give his own um, consent and did, enthusiastically, I might add. And then finally, um, he has to make the judgment that the decisions of the council are in harmony with the doctrine and discipline of the universal church. And I think we are very committed to that sense of communion. For, for us here in Australia to try and go our own way, we'd be going down the path of national churches, which is not the way of the Catholic church. So at this time, at this point of the journey, uh, I think being realistic, that question will not find its way into the agenda of the plenary council. However, the question of including women in leadership in new ways, that I think will. I mean, the problem with some of this, this discussion is it gives the impression that the only real form of leadership in the church is, is the ordained leadership. In other words, hierarchical. I don't think that's ever been true. It can look very, very much the truth, but I think we have to move beyond that sense that there is no leadership beyond um, the ordained leadership. I think we've got to uh, be much more focused upon new forms of charismatic leadership in the church. And some of the newer communities are showing the way on that score. You don't have to be ordained to lead in the church. I'm, we are coming very close to the hour mark, but we've got three more questions um, before we can break out into the groups, whoever wants to do that. Um, Michael Kelly, um, uh, good to see you, Michael. Abbot Michael Kelly has asked, uh, given the number of current commissions and investigations into institutions, it seems there is a breakdown of major societal institutions, church, banks, military, etc. Is this critical context being taken into consideration? Well, I think it is, and I, it's, it's a, a very important point. Again, the plenary council, like the church, doesn't inhabit a vacuum. And... Um, so much of, of what was evident even before COVID-19 has been accelerated mightily because of the pandemic. And this has had its effect upon the Plenary Council too. Um, so there are all kinds of things, as Michael points out, going on in society that we absolutely cannot ignore. And that's one of them, the, the one that Michael mentions, the crisis of institutions, not least the church, that, that a Plenary Council that, that inhabits a vacuum and ignores those kinds of large issues uh, that are even more evident because of the pandemic, I think is a plenary council that will look um, bloodless and is unlikely to produce the kind of missionary thrust, dare I say, or engagement with the world that I happen to think that the spirit is, um, is pointing to and empowering at this time. Tim, again, you, you would have thoughts on this, I'm sure. Yeah, just, just very briefly, because I know we're running out of time, but I I mean, the church is an institution. Um, the reason why it survived 2,000 years, I suppose, is partly due to that. But the question is, what kind of institution? Um, you know, when we, when we came up with the six themes uh, for discernment, um, each of the themes started with, what does it mean to be a Christ-centred church? Which is, and then there's a whole list of, of I suppose you'd call them characteristics that we would look to see in the church, missionary and evangelizing, humble, healing and merciful. If you were to look at those six uh, discernment themes, I think they describe a very healthy and outward looking institution. I think the real question is, have we allowed ourselves to become a deeply inward looking institution uh, when perhaps now we're being called to be an outward looking 
institution which is at the service of God's people, and that includes everybody. So I think it's what kind of institution and what kind of institution we want to be or we believe God's calling us to be will then determine some of the elements of the institutional structure, I think. Cool. Okay, I'm going to take the final two questions um, and then decide which, which of you wants to take them. Um, from Austin Ivory, uh, are the archbishops concerned by the worries in Pope Francis's letter to the people of God in Germany? And have these influenced the way uh, th they are carrying out the plenary council? What do you see as the temptations that need to be avoided? And then from Dermot McCarthy, if the Bishop of Rome is not part of the deliberative process, can the process of reception of the plenary council conclusions avoid a rupture? So perhaps um, Archbishop Tim could take the second one and Archbishop Mark take the first one. Uh, or if you want to do it another way around, let me. Uh, just give me the first one again. I was so dazzled by the second. I was distracted by my own thoughts. All right. The, the first one is, um, what are the... Lost of ivory, I know. I was also dazzled by the questioner. <laughs> it's an all-star cast whenever you come on a tablet webinar. Um, so... Yeah, so the question from Austin Ivory is, uh, what are the temptations that need to be avoided yeah. during the... Synodal process? way, yeah. Well, I, look, I, I, um, I think what the Germans are doing is very brave. The first German bishop I heard talk about this was, in fact, Cardinal Marx of Munich uh, at the meeting of the Presidents of Conferences in February of last year. And I, I was very impressed by, not only by Cardinal Marx, whom I had never met, but by what he said about the synodal way. Because I think, again, it's born of a sense of crisis in, in, in Deutschland. I, I think that, that the, the church in Germany is passing through some kind of sea change that has many different dimensions and aspects. So, so I completely um, understand why they would uh, set out upon a synodal journey. Now, Germany has a very particular history, and that's one of the reasons why in Rome there can be a certain neuralgic sense um, about the Tedeschi, the Germans, but uh, the creativity of the church in Germany is a remarkable thing to see. I've seen it among the bishops at meetings in Rome. I've, I've worked in parishes in Germany and uh, I would never, ever, ever underestimate the Germans or the German church. But I mentioned before the danger of going down the, the path of a national church. And, and sundering communion with the universal church. I don't think that is a path into the future. Um, so so I, uh, I don't share a great sense of anxiety about the synodal way in Germany. Uh, I have great confidence in um, the church in Germany. And I, I, I think that the, the dialogue, shall we say, even the tension between the Holy See and the church in Germany is a very creative thing. It's, it's, it's a, one of the messy and challenging parts of discernment. But I thought the Pope's letter was actually uh, a very fine uh, letter. And it was one that we here in Australia found very helpful. So um, people have warned us in Australia about the German contamination. I'm not sure that uh, it's a great threat to us here. And, and I certainly have been following the um, unfolding of the, the Zinedale Weg in, uh, in, in Germany. And uh, I certainly hope uh, that it will end up being um, a great gift to the Universal Church. And all this talk about, uh, uh, you know, heresy and uh, uh, I think is uh, alarmist and, and deeply unhelpful. And Archbishop Tim, on this the final question, um, whether or not, uh, if the, bish the Bishop of Rome, if the Pope is not involved, part of the deliberative process, can the process of reception of the plenary council uh, avoid a rupture? Uh, I, th I think it's a, a very good question. It's a deeply ecclesial question, and it, it really is asking about the role of the Bishop of Rome. Because we're having a plenary council, of course, the Pope is part of the deliberative process in the sense that any final outcomes of of our plenary council, uh, he will need to give his approval of. So he is part of the, that process. So, you know, I think it's a reminder to us that, that when Pope Francis talks about synodality, he always then brings in the uh, 
connected issue of collegiality, uh, and collegiality includes the role of the Bishop of Rome. You know, the, the role of the Bishop of Rome is to, to strengthen his brothers and sisters in the faith, to confirm them in the faith. And so uh, by doing what we're doing, a very uh, intentional and, and lengthy and, and deeply discerning process, which we hope will lead to some very positive outcomes for the, the church in Australia, and then uh, allowing the, the, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, to look at those things and confirm for us whether or not we're on the right track or whether, in his view, we are straying from the communion of the universal church. I think that's actually a, a very good element. Uh, he comes in at the end, but the Pope is not controlling what we're doing in the process, but he has the role of discerning, the final act of discernment in a way, whether or not what we have been able to do here together is in harmony with the universal um, teachings, traditions, uh, faith of the church. I think that's a positive and does enable us to move forward afterwards without any sense of rupture with the universal church. And where communion is ruptured, you cannot have the Holy Spirit. I think that's another important element of the discernment to keep in mind, that the, the disruption of communion cannot be a sign of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'd like to now uh, conclude this part of the discussion. Um, we've now got the opportunity for those who wish to, to go into the breakout rooms to continue to discussing some of these issues. Um, but I would like to uh, thank both Archbishop Mark and Archbishop Tim and Carol and all those who've taken part in, in the discussion for their time and particularly the archbishops for informing us about what this synodal process is looking like in Australia, the lessons they've learned. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, I think it's a very exciting time for the church. There's a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, opportunities for new for new growth and for development and renewal. So I think it's actually a very exciting time. Um, apologies for some of the disturbances during the, the Zoom call, but as the Archbishop said, synodality is messy. And so we've had a uh, <laughs> our own experience of that. So um, thank you very much for everyone who is uh, been take, taking part. Please do join for the for the discussion of those who are who are leaving. Have a good evening or rest of the day.